so uh, thanks everyone for coming back. And let's see, so I think we're in, we've got another great session here. Our second keynote of the day uh, is going to feature uh, Senator Scott Wiener, who was elected, and, and feel free to correct me on anything. I, I think I've got this all right, but interrupt me at any time. Who was elected in November uh, 2016, and he represents uh, District 11 in the California State Senate. District 11 includes all of San Francisco, Broadmoor, Colma, and Daly City, as well as portions of South San Francisco. Uh, in the Senate, Senator Wiener works to make housing more affordable, to invest in our transportation systems, increase access to health care, support working families, meaningfully address climate change uh, and the impacts of wildfires, reform our criminal justice system, reduce gun violence, reduce California's high poverty rate, and safeguard and expand the rights of all communities, including immigrants and the LGBTQ community. Um, I could go on and on and on about many of the bills that Senator Wiener has authored. I'll just give you a couple. Among them are SB 35, a landmark law to streamline housing approvals in cities that are not meeting their housing goals. SB 855, which makes California the national leader in mental health and addiction care access by requiring insurance companies to cover all medically necessary mental health and substance use disorder treatments. Uh, let's see, and many others. There's many others that I can read here. Uh, Larkin Street Youth Services honored Senator Wiener with the Ann B. Stanton Award for his work to combat youth homelessness in California. Senator Wiener was named Legislator of the Year by the California Sexual Assault Investigators Association and by California Attorneys for Criminal Justice for his work reforming California's criminal justice system and by the San Francisco Housing Action Coalition and California Building Industry Association for his work addressing California's housing shortage. He was also named Legislator of the Year by the California Solar and Storage Association for his work to expand clean energy. Before his election to the Senate, Senator Wiener served on the San Francisco Board of Supervisors, representing the district previously represented by Supervisor Harvey Milk. Uh, during his time uh, on the board, he focused extensively on housing and public transportation, authoring line, uh, laws to streamline approvals of affordable housing, to legalize new in-law units, and to tie public transportation funding to population growth. He received his bachelor's degree from Duke University and his law degree from Harvard Law School. And I just learned that, well, I just learned from his uh, doing a little research on the web that last week was his birthday. So happy belated birthday, <laughs> Senator Wiener. And we're delighted to have you here. And he's going to share some remarks. Then I'll ask some questions, and then we'll open it up. And I just want to ask all of you, I'm going to ask all of you for more help than the typical moderator. I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask the audience for more, because I'm not an expert in this arena. And I think there are many experts in the room, so I'm going to hang back a little bit. I'll ask a couple of questions, but then we'll open it up. So with that, please join me in welcoming Senator Wiener. <laughs> And I'm going to adjust the microphone. I think I'm just. We heard a lot about needing to adjust it down. We're going to uh -huh. adjust it up. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Uh -huh. Yeah, they don't make these <coughs> microphones <laughs> for tall people for sure. But I have a little one here, so hopefully that'll uh, that'll do the trick. So good afternoon, everyone, and um, thank you for having me uh, here today. Um, so uh, in this policy forum about homelessness, I'm here to talk about housing specifically, and I think it, it's so important to always remember that uh, the root cause of homelessness is a lack of housing. Uh, and I, I think for a lot of people, I know we have a lot of experts here in the room, but I think for a lot of people, because the most visible homelessness that people see are, are people who are in some, at some degree of crisis around mental health or, or substance use, um, people, even if it's um, subliminally, um, sort of form this impression that homelessness is really about get, uh, mental health treatment and, and drug use. And then we have all the debates about how do you address um, severe mental health and drug use um, problems, which is really important. And as you heard, I do a lot of work around expanding access to mental health treatment and drug use um, addiction. Uh, and making sure that we are using a science-based approach and giving people access to all of the treatments that we know work. And that's very important, both for the people on our streets and for the even dramatically larger number of people who are housed and suffering from mental health and addiction problems, because the vast majority of people who have mental health challenges are not homeless. 
um, and a huge number of people who are homeless do not have any mental health or drug use problems. They're just poor, uh, and they cannot afford housing. And so when we look at California, California is approximately 15% of the U.S. population, and these numbers are a few years old, so the pandemic probably changed things a little bit. We have the new point in time count, so we're going to get new data. But as of at least a few years ago, we're 15% of the population of the country, 25% of the homeless population of the country, and a slightly over 50%, 5-0% of the unsheltered homeless population. So we're only 15% population, 25% the total homeless population of the country, and 52%, I think it is, of the unsheltered homeless population. That's not because California has more mental health issues than the rest of the country, or it's not because California, people use more drugs than the rest of the country. People are using drugs everywhere. People have mental health challenges everywhere. It's because housing is too damn expensive in a dramatic, dramatic way. Uh, and, you know, the, the visible homelessness that we see in terms of people on the streets who are clearly in some sort of mental health crisis, that's like the tip of the iceberg. Most homeless people that we see, you don't know they're homeless, right? You either don't see them at all or you see them, they look just like you or me. They're go often going to work or they are uh, bringing their kids to school. Um, we have school districts where a very high percentage of those kids are living and are homeless with their families. Uh, and, but at night, they are going to a shelter, or they are living in a car, um, or they're just couch surfing, or just finding temporary places to live with friends or family. Uh, and they, I mean, if they're homeless long enough, they may, you know, that, that tends to probably put a lot of stress on people and they may develop <laughs> some mental health issues, but that's not the reason that they are homeless. They're homeless because there's nowhere that they can afford. And one of the, when people say, what keeps you up at night? One of the things that perpetually keeps me up, but I, mean, I usually sleep pretty well, but proverbially keeps me up at night is that we have huge, in the Bay Area, a huge number of low-income renters who are like the next wave of people who are homeless. Because if they lose their apartments, there's literally nowhere they can afford to go. And so they either leave the state entirely, and some people do, but that's not really a solution because people don't want to leave their communities, right? That's, this is their community, and they shouldn't have to leave their community. Uh, and so when we talk about actually solving homelessness, yes, of course we need a lot more mental health and addiction treatment. That's not going to solve homelessness, right? That solving homelessness means a place for people to live. I, sometimes people say to me, uh, well, uh, you know, Utah did this whole thing on homelessness and really dramatically reduced their homeless population. That's great. The reason they were able to do that is because housing and land costs so much less. Right? When you're able to have abundant housing and just build housing for people and create housing for people, that, that it's a lot easier to solve homelessness. So that's why when we have all these fights around housing policy in California, and you have all these people saying it's about local control. We don't want the state involved. We want it to be local control. And I say, you know what? Fr frankly, who cares who's making the decision? Most people, if you say, do you want city council to make a decision about housing or the state legislature or this or that? Most people are like, I don't care. I just want to make sure people have a place to live. And so we get into all these ridiculous arguments about who should be making the decision. And meanwhile, Rome is burning, right? The temporary lull we had in rents during the pandemic and all the NIMBYs ran around, who, the ones who were saying our problem was we had, before the pandemic, we had too many jobs. Let's ship the jobs elsewhere. Can you imagine? Let's collapse our economy so that I don't have to have, you know, an apartment building in my neighborhood. Um, uh, the, the, you know, or that, oh, the pandemic is here. The housing crisis is solved. Well, it's back. And the rents are just as high or even higher as they were before. And we're never going to solve it until we acknowledge that we have to build an enormous amount of additional housing. 
enormous. We didn't just develop a multi-million home shortage in California overnight. It was based on 50 years of anti-housing policy where we made it illegal to build anything other than a single family home in 70% of California. It didn't used to be that way. Back in the old days, we just built, built single family homes, you built apartment buildings, you built taller buildings, shorter buildings, you just built everything. And we used to build a lot of housing, and that was what some people, when people look at the quote unquote golden years, California was golden in some ways, not golden in other ways, but that was an era where working class people, people like from Oklahoma, could come here in the 30s and 40s and afford a home, where people could you know, come here and just have a middle class life and they could afford it. It might be a little, it was more expensive than the rest of the country, but they could afford it. And then we decided no more apartment buildings in the vast majority of the, of the state, that we were going to make it take three, four, five, ten years to get any projects approved. Even if you're building to the zoning, we're going to put you through all sorts of appeals and hearings and conditional use, and we're going to layer CEQA on top of it. We're going to give every tool to people to be able to slow down, obstruct, maim, or kill housing projects, whether it is a low-income housing project, whether it is a market rate project, mixed income, student housing on a UC campus, senior housing, we saw here in Palo Alto. We allowed the city of Palo Alto to kill a, a low-income senior housing project right here in Palo Alto, the kind of housing that most people would say should be a priority. And we let the voters of Palo Alto kill that. That should have been illegal under state law, but we allowed that to happen. And that's just a, one little example of what we were allowed to happen in this state for 50 years. And then you wonder why the average apartment in so many parts of the state might be $2,500, $3,000, $4,000 a month. You wonder why a teardown, quote unquote, teardown home in where we are right now will we'll sell for two, two and a half million dollars. That's not normal. But we've allowed it to be that way. And so when we have all of these fights, I don't like that kind of housing. I want it to be a little taller. I want it to be or a little shorter. I want it to be, you know, I don't want it to block my view. I, I, I'm worried about street parking. I'm worried about, you know, that it's a little too close to the lot line. People need to, like, focus on the big picture that people are living in their cars. Children are living in cars. There are children that show up to school every day from a shelter or a car, and then we expect them to learn. And so we need to stop being so absorbed in how is this going to impact my day-to-day -day life? Are we going to build housing? And so we're working very hard to change zoning, to say we should allow apartment buildings, small ones, duplex, fourplexes, and some taller ones throughout the state. No more banning everything other than a single family home. Single family homes are great. I grew up in one. We should have them. We should also have apartment buildings. We need both. They're both important. We need to streamline everything. We need to set what the rules are. This is the height you're allowed. This is the density you're allowed. Here are the objective design standards. And then you check all the boxes. Here's your permit within a matter of months, not years. We need to help cities fund basic services without forcing cities to constantly tax new housing through development fees because that's the only way that cities can actually raise revenue. Right now, we are forcing housing to pay for sidewalks, to pay for public transportation, to pay for sewer lines, all sorts of things that tax dollars should be paying for, but we're putting the cost on new housing, which makes housing more expensive. We need to stop forcing uh, housing to have excessive amounts of parking, which makes housing dramatically more expensive. And then we need to invest massively in subsidized housing. Um, we, we, to solve our middle class housing problem, we need dramatically more housing. Market rate housing, a ton of it, private sector. For our lowest income residents, the market is not going to serve them 
perhaps not ever, and certainly not for a long time. And that's where we have to ramp up our housing subsidies, which we pulled away from. We used to build a lot of what we called public housing. We now call it social housing. Because public investment in housing as a safety net to make sure that everyone, if you're low income, work, working class, that you can have a place to live. And we need to make it mixed income and not totally segregated by income, because that leads to the healthiest kinds of neighborhoods where everyone is like together and your neighbor isn't necessarily the same as you. Uh, and then we have to make sure that people are stable in their homes and, uh, and making sure that people who are renting um, who are not just arbitrarily thrown out on the streets. So there's a lot that we have to do. We're doing a lot of that work in the legislature. Um, we're working hard to hold our cities accountable to make sure the cities are doing the right thing, and that is really hard. It's like, what are they calling, like, trying to grab a, whatever, a fish in your hand or something like that, and it just slips right out. That was totally the wrong metaphor, but <laughs> something like that. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm optimistic that we're moving in a, be in a better direction, um, and the politics have completely shifted around housing. The polling for a while now has been off the charts everywhere. Everywhere, the people want more housing and are willing to accept more housing in their neighborhood. It's finally trickling up to the politicians. We're seeing more city council members who are willing to be out there, you know, vocally pro-housing. Uh, we are seeing uh, uh, people, NIMBYs who run for office who pretend that they're pro-housing, which I don't like when people pretend, but at least they, they feel the need to try to pretend that they're pro-housing. That's a start, that you'll feel that need. Now it's up to the voters and advocacy groups to tell voters who are the ones who are really pro-housing and who aren't. Um, we're seeing a much easier time in the legislature uh, passing aggressive housing policies than we used to just a few years ago. So the politics are shifting, and we just need to keep up the momentum because that's how we're going to solve this. So thank you. And I probably went over the 10 minutes, but uh, happy to take some questions. So you can say, yeah, great. Can I have that water? What's that? Water. Oh, is this yours? Yeah. OK, great. Thank you. Of course. Thanks for those remarks. Uh, so before I start, a few questions, and then I'll open it up. For everyone else, I want to encourage everyone who's here. I, I kind of don't want this day to be just like going to the movies. Like you went to the movies, it was like a good show. How's you think a little bit, and then you just go back about your daily business. So to the extent that any of you can think of ways that this can serve as a springboard to something after today, I welcome your suggestions. Jalu welcomes your suggestions. All of us, we're doing this because we want to help on this. Um, and bringing together leaders who have very different views, which is good, I think. Helpful, constructive to have people come together. So, Senator Weiner, I'm going to ask you some slightly outside the box questions. Um, and, but, and then you'll get more policy ish. But one question I just want to ask you about is so I'm an economist, academic. I teach undergrads here at Stanford, grad students try to do research that's going to lead to better economic policy. We're at the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research. So we're trying to do research that is going to lead to better economic policy at the local level, the state level, the federal level, in the US and around the world. Aspirational, big. <clears throat> and one of the challenges as I look at the landscape of these topics that, we are going to be, that we've been talking about all day today is data. It is partly a function of the fragmentation of government, state agencies, county agencies, city agencies, different agencies within a city or within a county or within the state. And then there's this general like, oh, I'm an academic. I'd like to do research in this arena. And it's not like the people who are on the front lines of these agencies greet you with open arms, like, wonderful. Stanford, you're here to help us figure out what's happening and to come in humbly and understand things, it just isn't happening. And so we've reached out to lots of people on the front lines of policy. I really want to do research in this area. Before six months ago, I had never used the word homeless in a paper that I'd written. So I'm like, this is an important area. I'd like to, but it is just, I cannot tell you, it is like a brick wall. I can get point in time count data Right? But suppose I just want to know something as mundane as how in real time are the characteristics of people who are homeless changing? 
How are the kids who are homeless right now doing in school, and how's that changing over time? How about their health care? What about crime? Anything. No. Sisyphean task to do it in any one city. Okay, in LA County, which is more complicated than here, I guess, there are 88 cities in LA County. It's just like, it, so I talk with other economists. I, I, I've asked the question of a lot of economists, why don't economists do research on homelessness data? So I'm just asking you, you're here, you're an important person in the California state government. What can be done? Or is that just, it just is what it is and we're just, we can't really be brought into the mix here. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think government outside of a few areas has never been awesome at data um, right. and, and systems. And so you have, even within cities, like the different systems, everything's very fragmented. And so you don't have the sort of seamless, unified um, databases. And so that creates some real huge problems. And so I think the answer is to force everything onto more, more unified platform within cities, but also you know, across the state. And we can mandate things through legislation, but then it's the implementation that sometimes can be a complete train wreck. And you know, you see sometimes some of these situations where like the courts, I think it was the court system was transitioning to a whole new, a whole new uh, system and it, and it just, it's been just a mess. Um, San Francisco Unified School District just transitioned to a new payroll system and literally teachers like haven't been getting paid, literally like not getting their paychecks. Um, like a principal, there was somebody seen the article in the paper, principal literally was loaning money to a teacher so she wouldn't get evicted. So I, I think go government needs to do better with technology and, and that's as a platform to actually you know, get that data. In the meantime, it, it is, you have to be resourceful in, in doing you know, public records requests to different agencies and you have to know what to ask for and how to ask for it, and it's really painful and, and bad, um, but that's, I think, the reason. I mean, basically, you connect with someone in government, you're an academic, they can just say, yeah, no, we really don't have that data, or we don't have time, or, like, it's just, it's, um, it's something that we've encountered again and again. Okay, so let's suppose we solve that. <clears throat> this is, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of, people who know me well <clears throat> know that I'm, like, increasingly ornery about these issues, but you're, but you're a, I, I'm so happy that you're here. I just wanna know, uh, and I could have asked this when I was in working in the federal government, but so policymakers interested in evidence? <laughs> Just a trying to shake question. things up. A um, <laughs> uh, often, yes. Um, it, to I think there are some some of us who are, there are some who are very it's a, it's a spectrum. Some who are extremely interested. And, it, and there's a range because politics also comes into play. And there are times when, you know, people have, you know, are, are interested in evidence, but then there's, you know, tough politics. I mean, the, the most extreme example is around vaccination policy where, like, we know that mass vaccination, like, works. Right, like thank God we didn't have this anti-vaxxer dynamic when when like the polio vaccine came out. Um, it, so we've, but you know I'm worried that polio is going to come back. It's it's back and it's still around in certain parts of the world, and and it's just a matter of time before it comes back here as people refuse to have their kids vaccinated. But that that's one where the evidence is so overwhelming, so overwhelming. But it's hard to get vaccine bills through the legislature, not because of the data or the, but because of the people just don't, don't want to deal with the craziness. And so we see it in, ho in housing policy as well, um, where you know, it's very clear what the right policy response is in terms of making it easier to build more housing, but people don't want to deal with all the NIMBYs yelling at them, and so they are hesitant to, to support it. But I do think in a lot of areas, data does matter. I find like in, you know, in healthcare, probably more so, um, people are willing to look at, at, at the evidence. I've just sort of, you know, it's still politicized. Um, but uh, so I, I think it's, I think generally yes, but not always. Like, I mean, I don't know. We all have like our biases. So as a researcher, I sometimes embark on a study and I 
have, may have a certain result that I want. <clears throat> like I worked on Obamacare for President Obama, and I'd want it to be like the most spectacular success in human history, having worked on it. But you know, it's trying to do evidence. We were talking earlier <clears throat> before you came about the 1% surcharge for mental health. So anyway, I don't want to, we're going to stay on housing construction. Anyway, I want to talk about, because you said in healthcare, it's especially in, valuable, because I want to know what that 1% did to improve mental health care. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I assume did that, I did, I, I'm kind of going off the road. Jalu is a bit like, what are you Darryl, doing up there? I gave you these questions, and you're, Steinberg, you're like, totally. <laughs> did, uh, Mark, yeah. Like, did Daryl Steinberg talk about it? He was the A little bit, the yeah. He was the that. person who authored it. He was um, sad so that the, he had sent it to the counties and not the yeah, cities. The, yes. Yeah. So the, the when, and now that he's the mayor of a city. He right, exactly. That's right. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, so that, that money was not, it's, some counties use it really well, some counties don't. Some counties, up until recently, were barely even spending it. LA County had accumulated a massive reserve of that money that what, it wasn't being uh, <coughs> spent. Um, and yes, he, he is correct. More of it should be going directly to the cities because if you're, uh, and I'm actually a believer, large cities that are within large counties should be their own counties. Oakland should not be part of Alameda County. Sacramento should not be part of Sacramento County. San Jose should not be part of Santa Clara County. Um, Fresno should not be part of, uh, part of Fresno County because what happens is the suburbs gang up on the cities and they don't care often about what happens in the cities. And the cities are the ones that are dealing with the bulk of, these, of the homeless and, and, so, and social service problems, and yet they're not getting a proportionate share. So in, a, a few years ago, I saw da data in Alameda County. Oakland had, I think, 75% of the homeless population in Alameda County, but only got 50% of the homeless funding. And so um, I agree with him on that front. OK, great. And so a, a quick, OK, so I'm going to ask one or two more questions that I'm going to go to all of you, because we have lots of housing policy and homelessness experts here in the audience. But I just want to get your take on <clears throat> and you sort of alluded to this in your remarks. Uh, are you concerned about the sort of out-migration of California? Um, so I, one thing that I just think isn't mentioned enough is there was this 2017 federal tax reform that eliminated the deductibility of state and local taxes up to uh, beyond $10,000. And that overnight made it massively more expensive to be in California than in other states like Texas or Florida. Um, since that time, you know, it's complicated. There's other things happening, obviously. But since that time, there's been an acceleration in movement from California to states like that. Worried about it? Not worried about it. I am worried about it. Um, I also think it's, it's not um, largely wealthy people who are leaving. Um, it's just, it's mo I think it's largely middle class, working class people who are leaving. Um, and a lot of them uh, have take the standard deduction um, and but they they just struggle to afford yeah. to live here primarily because of of housing. There are other challenges, but um, I think housing is a huge piece of why people li leave because they either you know you you have you're trying to raise kids and you have a place that's too small and you want a bigger place and you you're either going to have to move way far away from where you, where you work or you're or you're going to you know, have to just pay a huge percentage of your salary, and they see that. And you know, if you move to Colorado or Texas or where else, you could just get a lot more for your money. Of course, if you move to Texas, it means that you know you're moving into the Handmaid's Tale at this point, and <laughs> and into a you know, place that you know. And so, you know, do you know? You have to eyes wide open in terms of what you're moving moving into, um, but people do get pushed out. And, and we see it happening now in Idaho also, people moving there. And so, so the, if, we, if we want to continue to be a really vibrant, innovative, creative place where young people and young families, both who are here and want to come here, can keep making California the brilliant, amazing place that it is, you have to have housing uh, for people. I'm not saying that it's the only issue, but I think it is at the heart of the reason why so many people struggle just to be stable and succeed here. And you're kind of optimistic that things will get better over the next few, few several years? I think, I think I am, well, with housing, it, like it took us 50 years to get here. It's not going to take us three years to get out of it. 
Um, we, we do see that um, as we've, we have started to increase housing production, I think it's having some benefits, but the hole is so deep, it's gonna take time and we're not gonna fix it in a few years and we have to persevere. And so for example, right now, um, the, the, one of the most important processes that you may never have heard of is happening and that's called the housing element process where every city in California has to create a housing plan for the next eight years to accommodate their required housing allotment. And we fixed the process to a significant extent so that, you know, like the city of Beverly Hills in the last cycle was allotted three, three, one, two, three new homes for an eight year period. I'm not joking. Um, the city of West Hollywood was like 119. Um, a lot, really low allotments. We fixed that, so there now have, you know, Beverly Hills now is 3,000 instead of three. Um, but we're seeing some cities are very diligent, other cities are trying to scam the system and put together fake plans that are never gonna happen. And so we are counting on a combination of state agencies, the, our state housing department, our attorney general, Rob Bonta, who's super pro-housing, um, and uh, activists. Um, housing activists, including ones who file lawsuits against cities to enforce the law and make sure that cities like Palo Alto or San Francisco, which is being a little sketchy, um, or um, Los Angeles. Los Angeles is actually doing a very good job and had, is, is almost there. Um, and we have to make sure that cities are doing the right thing and have strong, strong accountability. And Governor Newsom, that's been one of his real pillars, accountability. And he's you know, proposed and we've adopted budget investments um, to make sure we have good enforcement. Okay, so with that, I would like to open it up to people here. We've got a question right here. No, uh, Lisa, microphone, yeah, for him right here. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I guess one observation I'd make is, is that, you know, it seems like we have no shortage of really excellent housing bills that are introduced into the legislature each year. And we do have something of a shortage of bills that end up passing. And I guess it's felt like the exception to that rule has been maybe 2017. I think that was the year in which you passed SB 35. We strengthened the Housing Accountability Act. It kind of felt like the stars aligned in a way between the governor, the legislature, the trade unions, the environmental groups, and things like that, that really created some very powerful tools. And so I would just love to know, like, how do you think about creating the political environment and the coalitions needed to, yeah. to pass legislation. So like we did, in 2017, we passed a really strong package of housing bills to streamline housing approvals, to strengthen some of our existing laws around um, in-law units or um, around cities following their own rules. So we did some really great work. Um, so then um, I did some, I didn't intend it to be this way, um, but I, for about a two, two and a half, almost two and a half year period, pursued this like mega bill. It was originally SB 827, it became SB 50, which would have like rezoned a lot of California for more density. It became this like, it was actually a really, the bill ended up not passing, but it was really healthy because I think it really shifted the conversation and, and it got an enormous number of people engaged. So it was healthy, but one of the things that it did that was less recognized is we blotted out the sun and sucked every ounce of oxygen out of the room. And there were a bunch of other bills that just sort of scurried through that would have been hyper controversial if there hadn't been this mega thing blotting out the sun. And so during the time that this, that this thing was out there blotting out the sun, we passed the, re, the reform to, to housing allocations. That was in 2018. That, that, that's the one that took Beverly Hills from three units to 3,000 units. I think you were telling me Palo Alto now has to add 6,000 new homes, which is much higher than what it had. San Francisco went from 28,000 for an eight-year period new homes to 91,000. So we're seeing that all over the state. That bill got very, very little attention. And in some ways, it, it might be the most impactful bill I've ever authored, even though most people have never heard of it. Um, Nancy Skinner, my amazing colleague from the East Bay, authored in 2018 or 19, I think, something called SB 330, which limits the number of hearings city, cities can have and does a whole bunch of things to just limit cities' ability to delay and obstruct the approval of housing. It's a very successful law. We also uh, passed several laws to, to finally close 
almost all the loopholes that cities use to stop people from putting in-law units in their homes. Um, that was in 2018 and 19 and 20. And so I agree with you, there are some bills that should have passed that didn't, but we were able to get a bunch through with not a lot of fanfare, which is good. Um, and so we just have to keep going. Can I ask, a, can I, I'm gonna interrupt and then we're gonna ask Larry. Go ahead. Uh, so states used to have no, the state used to have no teeth in ensuring local governments follow stuff. Like you just said Palo Alto is supposedly supposed to build 6,000 new yeah. units. What happens to Palo Alto if they build zero? Yeah, so what happens is they, they, Palo Alto will lose um, a bunch of its land use control. So we actually have teeth. Now this is the bill you just mentioned, SP35, the first bill I introduced. It provides that when a city does not meet its housing goals at different income levels, then it becomes what we call streamlined, which means you lose all discretion. CEQA goes away. Any kind of discretionary hearings, approvals, you the city no longer has any discretion. Just have to so that means if, if this lot is zoned for 30 units with X, Y, and Z requirements, and someone comes forward and says, I want to build 30 units with all your requirements, you have between three and six months to give them a permit, depending on the size. Um, and what that has really done, especially for 100% affordable housing, which causes all these huge fights, like basically, Almost no city in California meets its below market rate goals. About maybe almost half meet their market rate. So about half or so of the cities, uh, SB 35 streamlines all of their housing, market rate, below market rate. For almost 100% of cities, you have um, for, um, 100, for affordable housing, for below market rate housing, they're streamlined. So uh, Bridge Housing, which is the largest builder of 100% affordable housing in the state of California, that builds low-income housing, uh, has told us that because of SB 35, their average amount of time to get their permit, average, has gone from seven years to four months. And so we, and that, that's because we went and we said, if you don't meet your goals, you lose the ability to have an opinion about whether it should be approved. Okay, um, that's good, so, that, that sounds good. That sounds like teeth. Yeah. Okay, Larry had a question. Wait for Mike. Yeah. So there's a lot of conversation about increasing density, and I suppose there's arguments about whether market rate housing availability increases the availability of affordable. But there, with respect to market rate housing, um, for the families you mentioned, a lot of folks don't want to live in a small apartment downtown where most of the effort seems to be. And the intersection of CEQA and increased state mandates on VMTs and GHGs that prevent homes from being built locally and cause them to be built three hours away by commute. Is there any understanding of how the CEQA and GHD and VMT and CARB regulations are impacting the ability to build homes? Yeah, so let me start with the first comment you made about market rate housing. So we call it market rate housing, sometimes people will dismiss it as quote unquote luxury housing. There is a, such a thing as luxury housing where you have you know, your, your gym and your massage, your massage services and whatever. But, but, when, we, but luxury, when people say luxury housing, they mean it's really expensive. Yeah, it's really expensive because there's not enough of it. The hundred year, you could go and rent, try to rent or buy a 100-year-old home, and it's also really expensive. And... And I, I'm not going to. I'm not going to actually ask people to raise their hands because I don't want. I don't want to put people on the spot to say what kind of housing they live in. If I were to go around and say, raise your hand. Well, not for the students who are, might be living in, but for people who are not living in like university housing, in any given room, say, raise your hand if you live in a home that that, that is not subsidized, that's not below market rate. Ninety-nine percent of the hands will go up. When we talk about market rate housing, I live in a 1965, 500 square foot condo in San Francisco, 57 years old now. That's, a, that's a market rate housing. Any home that's built by a private developer, whether 100 years ago, 50 years ago, or today, is market rate housing. And we can dismiss it as luxury housing because it's really expensive, whether it was built 100 years ago or today. It's expensive because there's not nearly enough of it. And anyone who tells you that we can solve our housing crisis by only building subsidized housing has a bridge to sell you. Because unless we're going to restructure the American economy 
to basically take over housing and do just Marshall Plan level investment in housing, which could be a really great thing. I don't see it. I mean, we're, we're fighting to make sure that we still have a democracy in this country, and we, we had this, this 2017 tax cut and everything happened. We couldn't even get the, you know, the Obamacare is amazing, but you know, the whole public, the public option, remember that? They called it like communism. So I don't see that happening in the near future. And so to solve it, we need the subsidized below market rate housing, but we also need a ton of market rate housing. I know it's not what you were suggesting, but a lot of people, a lot of people make the argument, don't build any market rate housing, which means no, no private participation, which means we'll have a permanent massive housing shortage. In terms of the um, car rules, so there's a, a, a real dispute happening now uh, where the California Air Resources Board has adopted a rule about vehicle miles traveled, and that has to be sort of factored in to basically CEQA analysis for if you're, um, in terms of building housing to try to, to, try to avoid sprawl. It's an anti-sprawl measure. So if you're building housing that's going to cause people to drive a lot more because it is you know, far away from job centers, for example, uh, that's something we want to discourage. And, and I agree, we ha you know, I, yes, not everyone wants to live in an apartment building or a condo building. And people, you know, a lot of people want to live in single family homes. We have a geometry problem, right? Because then the only way you can really build those homes is to go out further and further and further into wildfire zones and, you know, and you're, and you're increasing vehicle miles traveled so it increases carbon emissions. And so the, you know, the, the, the question is, do we want to keep doing that, right? And, and what, there are real downsides to, to doing that and how, how are people going to be living in the future? And in the future, plenty of people are still going to be living in single family homes, but the reality is it's going to be harder and harder for people to have that life going into the future. Um, because I don't see us continuing to build infinitely into wildfire zones. It's just not sustainable. More questions? Right here. Sorry, was there another? Oh, I'm sorry. Was there another? Sorry. I had one here, but there was there one over here? Or, yeah, over here, I guess. Yeah. And then we'll come to you. Like, who's in? I don't know who's. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. They're in charge. <laughs> so, oh, wow. Okay. I want to go back to your question mark about data and kind of push a little bit more on that because from my point of view, I'm an economist, it seems like the data is there, but sometimes there's just a ton of inertia and a lack of willingness to kind of look into it. A lot of times policymakers even know the answer, right? So continuum of care reform in 2012, like you go to the state of California and ask, hey, can I get the data to actually look at that? And they say, no, we know it was a shitty policy. Like we don't want to know how bad it was. And so I just wonder, you know, there's kind of three pieces, right? Policymakers come up with the policies, implement the policies, providers implement it on a micro scale. <clears throat> and I think of economists as being in this like cycle of life in the sense that we can kind of look back and say, what did the policy do? What were the unintended consequences? What can we do better? And then it goes around again. And so sometimes though, when these programs exist, a ton of money's been put, in, put into them, but there's just a lack of willingness. So I'd be, Curious to hear what you say in terms of like what we can say as economists to really try to pitch what we can do and what we can bring to the table to really impact change. That was for you, I think. Is that for me or for no, you? No, I mean, it's <laughs> both of you, I guess. You but it's, I mean, it's, like the data exists, really. It's it's just that there's a lack of willingness, I think. You're. A, um, I think. I mean, yeah. The, I mean, data clearly exists somewhere, right? And that's what I sort of was mentioning at the beginning that there's this like lack of integration. So it's like you have to know, here are the 30 different places I have to go and fight to get the data to get it all together. And so you're right, a lot of times people just don't even bother because it's, it's too hard. And that's why I think having a more integrated system would be better. But you know, frankly, even in, uh, even in um, private healthcare sector, Right. I just got my doctor referred me to a specialist to have a consultation, and I want her to, to see all my medical records, but she's in a different system, so she has no access to my medical records. And so I had a message to my doctor's office, what do I do? And I'm like, do I have to go in the system and start printing out stuff? So, I can, so even like in the, the health, healthcare sector, which is 
presumably more efficient in government, we still have you know, systems that don't talk to each other. And I, I think that, I'm not saying that's the whole problem, but I, I think sometimes that's the problem, is part of the problem, that people don't even know where to go. Can I tell you a story about this? So I once collaborated, started to collaborate with a county in California that I won't name, <clears throat> that was interested in evaluating the effect of a pretty intensive intervention for homeless individuals several years ago on their healthcare spending. So I had been working with data for the state of California, the universe of hospital ER visits, and the universe of hospital admissions and discharges. And the idea was that it's an expensive program, but their instinct was that the program to a large extent, perhaps fully, paid for itself by keeping people out of the emergency room and keeping people out of, you know, not, let's say, ODing and getting hospitalized. Sound like super interesting, really interesting research topic. We're gonna link up the data with the house homeless intervention with data from the state healthcare agency. And the funny thing was, the county actually didn't wanna send the data to the state so they sent the, the, this data. We had to merge the data because the like I, I, it was this bizarre thing of like a little bit of mistrust between a county government and state government. But in any case, sitting in meetings with people in the county, and they said uh, one of the people who was spearheading the government team said, "So when you show that this thing saved more than eighty-eight hundred dollars per participant, that's something that will be helpful to us to sort of go out and say to the world." I said, "Well." Yeah, well, I just don't know what I'm going to find. I haven't even like started the project yet. I don't really know. And like that moment, the sort of wind went out of the sails. Like it just died. And I, you know, I was doing it for free. Like I'm not. I'm just here. This is a research project. And so I think that is a challenge because people who are on the front lines, they're doing something, and they think they know. And if and so I mean, I'm not saying I think they were incredibly well intentioned. People And I will also say that to add further sand to the gears of this process were the various lawyers who were like, oh, you can't link for this or that reason. So anyway, lawyers are, I, you know, my brother's a lawyer, my best friend's a lawyer, but I'm you lawyer. guys are kind of a, I'm a lawyer. I know you are, that's why I'm looking at you while I say this. <laughs> you guys are oh. very challenging for researchers no. who are trying to put together data to provide evidence so that we make better policy. But if we can't, anyway. This is why all lawyers should have to spend part of their career as not lawyers, because since I have been, I practiced for like 15 years and then last 12 years I've been Board of Supervisors in the State Senate. And now I am perpetually fighting with, uh, whether it was the City Attorney's Office or our Legislative Council. And I, yeah, so I, I yeah. It's, but it's just a challenge, because academics, I think we would like for our, like sometimes we get criticized as your result, your research isn't real world relevant, but I mean, sometimes we lean in to try to make it real world. So I, I don't know, I'm not saying there's plenty of blame for the academics, so I'm not pointing, trying to point fingers, but it's just, I think it's an illustrative story, and I think it's not isolated. I think that kind of thing is behind a lot of the dynamics between the research community, we're at CEPR, Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research, and the sort of people on the front lines. Um, okay, we've got maybe time for one more question. Right here. Um, first, I, I, I actually just have a, an interesting, uh, hopefully it's an interesting question for you, Scott. Given the fact that you, in authoring the bill of SB 35, figured out a way to, you know, kind of put teeth in it that, you know, actually has seen results. Um, I mentioned earlier, we've done an analysis um, at the Price Center for Social Innovation where we looked at how many people were paying more than half their income as rent in California. It's around 1.2 billion households. We looked at what if we actually gave them a subsidy while they waited for a housing choice voucher, because all of them, are, or almost all of them are eligible. Um, it would cost roughly $6,500 a person on average, some less, some more, about $9 billion. Um, one of the criticisms of an approach where you actually had a fully functioning rental tax credit for, for these folks is that if you didn't actually have more housing built, of course it would just increase the price of housing. Any thoughts on what might be the right kind of teeth to put in such a bill? I know that there's a bill, and currently I can't remember if it's Senate or Assembly, to say, well, let's increase the renter's tax credit to 1,000, but that's nowhere close to where it needs to be, but yeah. you know, it, it's moving in that direction. How, what kind of teeth might be possible to make sure that localities even you know, streamline housing more or met their housing element goals more rapidly, those kinds of yeah, things. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that, that's part, part of the issue because people advocate for certain kinds of 
interventions, and I support re rental supports of different, but it, it needs to be accompanied with the other. And that's why I think there, there, are, there are some uh, tenant advocates who are very oppositional to building new housing, because they think any kind of new housing is going to potentially you know, destabilize existing tenants. And I've always said, you know, we can, we can have protections for renters so that they're not getting pushed out when new development comes in. You can have those protections. They can be strong. But the idea that you, you would protect the people living there, which I support, but not solve the underlying problem for why is it that if someone, in, a, in, a, you know, in, many, in many parts of the universe, if you happen to lose, you know, get, get evicted, or people leave their housing for a million reasons, not just because of eviction, right? You could have a divorce, or you have falling out with your roommate, or you need to move out because you've got a job and it's no longer convenient. And, and in, in, a, in sort of more normal world, you, you just find a new place. And it might, be, it might be challenging, but you can find a new place. And this whole notion, this whole existence that we have now where losing your apartment means that there's nowhere else for you to go, that's not normal. And so we, ha we need the subsidies to stabilize people. And we have, we, we have to do what we've been doing, passing state laws to ensure that there is accountability. Uh, and then enforcing the heck out of them. Um, because we have strong laws in place. There's, more, there's definitely more to do. Um, but if we, if we just started really meticulously enforcing the laws we have, w that would go a long way. OK, so I think we should wrap here. So please join me in thanking uh, Senator Weiner for spending time with us today.